In the course of his extensive and very well-documented explorations Fawcett discovered many other strange and unusual things. On one of his South American journeys he lived among a tribe of white Indians known as the Tapuyas, describing them as follows. The Tapuya tribe are as fair as the English and they have hands and feet that are small and delicate. His book also tells of another Amazonian tribe who were red-haired and also fair-skinned. On one expedition local Indians told him of a cave filled with markings or petroglyphs in an unknown language that exist at Villarica and he heard many stories about lost cities deep in the jungles. One tale in particular, a story recorded in manuscript form by Jesuit missionaries in the 1700s, told that in the jungles of Kayab, Brazil, somewhere in the Mato Grosso region, there are apparently strange bright lights that shed no heat, which the Indians say, have burned continually and quite unattended for many generations and still burn today in the ruins of now uninhabited and long dead cities. Fawcett claims to have also once seen these lights from distance himself. It is rumored by some that just such an eternal, cold light energy has also been found in ancient Roman and Egyptian tombs and in areas of Tibet and India though I am unable to confirm these rumors. The production of such an eternal cold light source is beyond our current level of technology and still remains a puzzle to modern science. Colonel Fawcett had first heard these strange stories sometime after he had accepted his first survey contract. Until he had known of them, his South American expeditions were completely oriented toward civil and engineering work though even while performing his daily tasks he continued to nurture a keen interest in the forest. During his surveys he also made copious amounts of notes containing detailed observations about everything he saw, especially the ways of the white settlers, the Indians of the forest, and the forest wildlife all of which are recorded in detail in his book. However after Fawcett became familiar with the story of Francisco Raposo his attentions and interests began to shift away from just pure engineering and more toward ventures of exploration and discovery. In one place in his diaries he records a remarkable conversation with another explorer concerning an unusual forest bird that nests in perfect round holes in rock cliffs. The man had actually spent 25 years living in the forests with the local natives and he had this to say. They make the holes themselves. I've seen how they do it, many a time. I've watched, I have, and seen the birds come to the cliff with leaves of some sort in their beaks and cling to the rock like woodpeckers to a tree while they rubbed the leaves in a circular motion over the surface. Then they would fly off, and come back with more leaves, and carry on with the rubbing process. After three or four repetitions they dropped the leaves and started pecking at the place with their sharp beaks, and here's the marvelous part they would soon open out a round hole in the stone. Do you mean to say that the bird's beak can penetrate solid rock? Oh. I don't think the bird can get through solid rock. I believe, as everyone who has watched them believes, that those birds know of a leaf with juice that can soften up rock till it's like wet clay. The man continued with a personal story about his nephew. He had walked through the thick bush to a nearby camp to retrieve his horse, which had gone lame and had been left there temporarily. He noticed, when he arrived, that his new Mexican spurs had been eaten away almost completely. The owner of the camp asked him if he had walked through a certain plant about a foot high, with dark reddish leaves. The young man said he had walked through a wide area that was completely covered with such plants. That's it. They said, that's what's eaten your spurs away. That's the stuff the Incas used for shaping stones. The juice will soften rock up till it's like paste. You must show me where you found the plants. But when they retraced the young man's steps they were unable to locate them. There is also an interesting footnote to Fawcett's story about these birds that lends further credence to the tale. A man who had been a member of a Yale Peruvian expedition that discovered Machu Picchu in 1911 wrote this strange story in his notes. Some years ago, when I was working in the mining camp at Saro de Pasco a place 14,000 feet up in the Andes of central Peru. I went out one Sunday with some other gringos to visit some old Inca or pre-Inca graves to see if we could find anything worth while. We took our grub with us, and, of course, a few bottles of pisco and beer, and a peon cholo to help us dig. Well, we had our lunch when we got to the burial place, and afterwards started to open up some graves that seemed to be untouched. We worked hard, and knocked off every now and then for a drink. 
I don't drink myself. But the others did, especially one chap who poured too much pisco into himself and was inclined to be noisy. When we knocked off, all we had found was an earthenware jar of about a quart capacity, and with liquid inside it. I bet it's she shot, said the noisy one. Let's try it and see what sort of stuff the Incas drank. Probably poison us if we do, observed another. Tell you what, then let's try in on the peon. They dug the seal and stopper out of the jar's mouth, sniffed at the contents and called the peon over to them. Take a drink of this shisha, ordered the drunk. The peon took the jar, hesitated, and then with an expression of fear spreading over his face thrust it into the drunk's hands and backed away. No, no, senor, he murmured. Not that. That's not she shot. He turned and made off. The drunk put the jar down on a flat-topped rock and set off in pursuit. Come on, boys, catch him. He yelled. They caught the wretched man, dragged him back, and ordered him to drink the contents of the jar. The peon struggled madly, his eyes popping. There was a bit of a scrimmage and the jar was knocked over and broken, its contents forming a puddle on top of the rock. Then the peon broke free and took to his heels. Everyone laughed. It was a huge joke. But the exercise had made them thirsty and they went over to the sack where the beer bottles lay. About ten minutes later I bent over the rock and casually examined the pool of spilled liquid. It was no longer liquid. The whole patch where it had been, and the rock under it, were as soft as wet cement. It was as though the stone had melted, like wax under the influence of heat. The head of the Machu Picchu expedition Hiram Bingham also tells a similar tale that was related to him by natives of how the edges of great stones would be rubbed with the juices of a certain plant which would render them like clay too and create a perfect joint. The possibility of such a plant existing is not at all unreasonable. There are still a myriad of undiscovered species in the Amazon basin. Unfortunately though, due to the rapid rate of deforestation that is occurring there, we may fast be running out of time to find it. Bingham himself never put much faith in the story as he could never conceive of how such enormous stones would have been lifted in the first place for such rubbing of the edges to have taken place, let alone placed it into its position in the wall. Local legends have always insisted the task was done by giants and Bingham himself surmised that such could only be the case. Impossible buildings The ability to soften stone would certainly go a long way in explaining the unique stonework found in the Mayan structures and before you laugh the thought off as ludicrous, consider that many of the fortresses actually bear some very unusual markings that could easily be explained by tooling the surface while it was still soft. It should also be realized that many of the stones used in these structures are truly immense, some as tall as three meters and virtually impossible to maneuver into place using any of our, our current expertise. And not to forget that some of the stones, like this famous one at Cuzco figure 64 have up to 12 perfectly fitting angles, and that is just the ones that are visible on the face. Beneath the face, the back and side sections are also perfect, in fact, so perfect that a razor blade cannot fit between the joints and it is the same over the entirety of the wall on every block of stone. Consider that fact when looking at the wall at Saxe Hugh Heyman figure 65. Apart from it resembling a wall made of great play dough from a distance, such precision is, as yet, impossible using any kind of cutting tool and even if it were possible to cut the stones with such precision, how on earth would they have then been maneuvered into place? Presumably. If they were hewn and then placed in the walls, the process would also have been repeated many times over for each block for fine adjustments to be made to the angles in order to reach the absolute precision obtained in every block. Such a method is not only implausible but is nothing short of impossible and so it stands to reason that the obvious and somewhat disturbing explanation is that the joining edges, quite simply, were not cut in any conventional sense. It is known that the stones were in fact quarried and transported to the site for the quarries they came from have been located. But how were they worked to such perfection and then transported to the site which is located 13,000 feet 4 kilometers above sea level and how were the joints perfected? When one looks at these monument structures they certainly do have the appearance of a wall that is made of clay that has silicified. Again, take the wall at Saxe Hugh Heyman's fig. Five. It seems enormously strange, 
and also highly unlikely for the builders to have gone to such incredible trouble to make sure the stones fitted together with what is an absolutely ridiculous degree of perfection, while using the most difficult shapes imaginable, only then to leave the visible face of the wall virtually covered with a myriad of imperfections that makes them look rough and unfinished.